Lynn. Right. Okay, you, Lynn. Well, good evening, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you may be. I happen to be in Tel Aviv. My name is Lynn Julius, and I'm ably assisted tonight by Lawrence here, technical support. Um, uh, here we are uh, doing another Harif lockdown lecture. Even if you're not locked down, we're carrying on with our lectures. Harif, for those who don't know us, is the UK Association of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. Of course, you don't need to be one to be interested in what we do. And what it is we do is to try and educate people about the history and culture of these Jews. Uh, we are a group of uh, volunteers, there are about six of us, and um, we have very limited resources, but we, we try our best. Um, please do check out our website, which is www.harif.org. If you'd like to be updated with our activities and sent uh, Zoom links, you have to subscribe to our mailing list because we don't have pre-registration. Uh, do also check out our sister website, Point of No Return blog, uh, and that keeps you up to date with the news. Uh, this is being recorded, this session, and you will find it on the YouTube channel, the Harif YouTube channel. And there you can catch up with all our past, um, our past events. We have done over 70 of them on a whole variety of different subjects. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions after our speaker has finished his presentation. Um, we will we have, un we have muted everybody, so I apologize for that. But if you would like to make a comment or ask a question, please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Well, without further ado, the topic of tonight's session is, um, is the Karaite community of Egypt. Um, the Karaites are a very ancient branch of Judaism. And to tell you about this community, we are absolutely delighted to welcome with us David Avadia, who was born in Cairo and left Egypt at the age of 12. He now lives in San Francisco. He is absolutely passionate about his community um, and he serves as the president of the Karaite Jews of America after multiple terms. He also heads up the congregation B'nai Israel in San Francisco, which is the only Karaite synagogue in the US. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to David, and thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, I need to get the share screen, please. Yes. It's on. It's on. There you go. So can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So thank you, Lynn. I'm honored to have been asked by you and Harif to make this presentation, The Karai Journey from Cairo to California. I'm happy to share some of my own story that reflect the reality of a changing Middle East in the mid 20th century, ending more than a millennium of Jewish life in Egypt, as well as a brief introduction to my community, 
fascinating history and heritage, but which the larger Jewish world knows little about. The history of the Karai Jews of Egypt encompasses a time frame impossible to cover in a short presentation, but I will share at least some of the highlights of the cultural and social life in Egypt, the unique aspect of our religious heritage, our key contribution to society, and how we adapted to a new and changing world. I thank my wife and partner, Mary Ellen, for her help and support in this and all endeavors. My story, I have so many memories of my youth in Cairo, Egypt, where I was raised in a large family with three siblings. Our life was comfortable, shaped by the heritage of our strong Karai Jewish community. My father was a beloved professor of mathematics and science. He served from 1942 to 1962 in two schools, where he resigned in 1962 before us leaving departure to France. Uh, some of the comment that I heard that he was, there was a great loss and basically for them and as a leader, referring to his excellent ability, punctuality and character. My mother was a homemaker who also was very engaged in a community life. She earned her degree from Ecole Profili de Couture with the goal of becoming a fashion modiste, but she channeled her artistic talent to her own enjoyment until we moved to San Francisco, where she put her skill to help us survive. A few memories of my youth, my deeply loving parents and siblings, a beautiful home, my mom great cooking, great evening with friends at the movie theater, watching film from our own terrace on the outdoor screen of a neighborhood cinema, months long summer outing at beach resort like Russell Bar and fun with friends in private camp in Alexander. The nurturing private civil school uh, to learn, visit famous Gropi Cafe, sports and excursion to the pyramid. It's a group photo picture when I was 10 years old in 1960 of the entire family. This picture shows when I was one month old. This picture shows a, a field trip to the pyramid and my father is noted in the red circle. This is a photo in the first grade. My maternal grandfather had a beautiful villa in Hawaii. We often visited. I had beautiful memories, a special time with him. In 1956, he had to leave. He immigrated with my uncle, family to Switzerland first, and then to Italy. My paternal great-grandfather, Farag Abdullah, served as the chairman of the Egyptian hallmark of gold and silver for 20 years. His large portrait had a place of honor in our home. The good and the bad. My family was just one of many common Akari Jewish family who made an impact on public life in Cairo up until the 20th century where things changed radically. Like all Jews living in predominantly Muslim states, we experienced anti-Semitism, but we had some Muslim friends and neighbors we enjoyed the cosmopolitan richness of Egypt at the time, and most importantly, we had each other. But the security of the Karite and the Rabbinite Jewish community in Egypt will soon end, following the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. On June 20th, 1948, a bombing by the Muslim Brotherhood in the Jewish quarter of Cairo 
killed 18 members of the Karaite community. Following the 1948 Arab-Israeli War and the 56 Tuez crisis, the Egyptian government progressively introduced aggressive policy changes that included the seizure of assets belonging to Egyptian Jews and banned them from re-entering Egypt if they left. In 1956, anyone with foreign nationality, French, Tunisian, English, were given a couple of days to leave the country and all their property was placed under government control. My grandfather and uncle were among these people. Jews were for forced out of jobs and had to leave Egypt. My family decided to leave in 1962. Following the Six Day War in 1967, all remaining Jews men over the age of 18 were forced into detention camp for two to three years. In 1955, a trial of supposed spy for Israel known as Mavon Affair or Operation Susanna result, resulted in the hanging of two Jewish men, one was the Karait and the other one was the Rabbanite. Much Egyptian mistreatment of the Karait was due to the Egyptian government capturing of Musa Moshe and Marzouk, a Karait Jew accused of spying for Israel. He had ultimately he was ultimately executed in 1955 for his role in act of espionage and violence against the state. The, the situation became increasingly destabilizing and Jews began to leave in large number in what we call the second exodus. Dear Father, please get us out of Egypt. Things are getting worse. Maurice got beaten up, Uncle Zaki got electrocuted, and Moshe was hanged. Everyone hates us, Jews. Please help us, in Siri Mireille. Mireille now lives in her 80, lives in New York with her family. We are in touch on a regular basis. By 1962, it was time for my family to go. Many other relatives had left the year before. I was 12 years old when we left our home in 1962 from the port of Alexandria en route to Paris. I have vague memories of the interrogation and searches of our luggage before we boarded the ship. After we boarded, the police captain came up to our cabin. He threatened us that he would have us removed from the ship unless we paid it. My mother's response was very clever. We did not know what our future would hold. My father had not wanted to leave our home and our good life, but my mother prevailed. We left everything behind and took only what we could carry. Adults could take $20 each with them and children 10. With the help of the Jewish aid organization, we were able to book passage by ship to France via Italy and to survive five months in Paris while waiting for the visa to enter the United States. I made most of my school days, excelled in study, and enjoy exploring Paris on the weekend after finishing my schoolwork. I was the youngest in the class as my father had made me skip a grade in Cairo. It was only years later when I was going through my father's papers, one day that I found his receipt and canceled check, $5, $10, $20 every month to pay highest back based on the promissory note dated back in May 13, 1963, the day we left France. In 1985, there were just a few Karaid left in Cairo. These are two of the caretaker of the Karaid community since. Of the original census from 1948, there were an estimate of 5,000 Karaid, which is about 6.3% of the 80,000 Jews living in Egypt. By 1970, almost everybody had left. Today, Approximately 45,000 Karaite Jews are scattered across the globe. Here in San Francisco, my family joined a small but growing community of Karaite Jews 
who had come before us, and like so many other stateless immigrants, we were grateful to live in peace, with security, education, and freedom to build success life. Testimony to this large number of highly respected professionals among our ranks, doctors, lawyers, engineers, professors, accountants, businessmen, and nurses, and so on. We now have much to be thankful for and much to give back to our next generation. My parents found job to survive. My sibling and I worked while going to school, delivered newspaper, and finding other jobs as we got old. We all went to on to higher education. My sibling and I all began successful career in raised family. Following my undergraduate degree in civil engineering, I received a fellowship to Sanford University where I earned my master in civil engineering. Years later, I earned an MBA from UC Berkeley and continued my career specializing in structural and seismic analysis of nuclear power plant and other large facilities. We all honored our parents, our parents until they died. My father's 80th birthday celebration took place on the same weekend that my daughter bought mitzvah, where 250 people attended the two parties. The bigger picture, who are the car eight? A quick overview of the modern history. Most historians believe that the car eight emerged in the eighth century in Baghdad as a sect of follower of Anand ben David, who called themselves Ananite. It is said that the oldest continuing synagogue in the world is in Jerusalem, about which you'll hear more later, was founded by him. During the Golden Age, the Karate movement from the end of the 10th to the beginning of the 11th century, Karate community appears throughout the Middle East, the Byzantine Empire, the Caucasus, and, and Egypt. According to different estimates, around 30 to 40 percent of the Jewish population at that time followed the Karate movement. The community, nearly unique in Jewish religious tradition, relied solely on the written sacred text of the Torah for understanding and interpretation. Jewish tradition and laws, Karaim literally mean readers of the Hebrew scripture. Karaim scholars and rabbis played a key role in preserving the written Hebrew language over centuries. The Karaim developed a strong contact with the Muslim scholars and they were the first Jewish author to write important words on Hebrew grammar. And this reliance on the written word remained a cornerstone for descendants of the Karaite Jewish community in Egypt now sc scattered around throughout the world. This is the old Cairo Jewish quarter. The Karaite and Rabbinite community were mutually supportive over much of their history. During the medieval period, Karay Jews were listed as the majority of donors in the records of funding and campaign for the Rabbinite Yeshiva in Jerusalem. The Rabbinite community of Lestat, Egypt, donated food and money to the needy Karay. The Karay community gave part of their best cemetery to the Rabbinite. The Asian roots of the Karay Jewish community of Egypt are perhaps most evocatively reflected at the Pasatine Cemetery in Cairo, about which you'll learn more later in my presentation. The cemetery was established in the ninth century during the Egypt Tulanid dynasty. The land consisted of 147 acres with separate and equal grounds for Rabbinite and Karai Jews. The division of the land to house the dead gives proof of the present size and prominence of the Karai community Cairo, going back more than a million years. In 2019, international attention was focused on the mid medieval Karate community of Cairo, where Professor Yoram Maitel of the Korean University in Israel rediscovered a handwritten thousand year old biblical codex, the Karia bin Anan manuscript, lost in time in the long deserted. I was delighted to join the webinar about this discovery, which became for me a rediscovery of my own past. 
Moshe Adari was the synagogue in which my family and I, as a child, had worshipped before leaving Cairo in 1962 and immigrated to the United States. Professor Maitel presentation was a very personal to me, and I immediately began to think about the potential opportunity to reestablish pathway to my past with the objective of telling our story to our community, remarkable history, and the lost heritage in Egypt. This led directly to my work and that of my wife, Mary Ellen, in collaboration with the American Research Center in Egypt and the Drop of Milk Association, which about I will share more later in the presentation. In 1988, the Magnus Museum had a big exhibit where we had our chief rabbi, Haim Levy, visit from Israel. In 2018, they also hosted an extensive exhibit, the Karaid Camp. Picture on the top right is the ketubah written in Arabic. Our history has been misrepresented by many scholars and writers. I've always felt that we must do more to tell our own story and not to let it be told only by others who inter whose interpretation may reflect their own bias. I'm very proud that my former father-in-law, historian Murad al who passed away in 2007, published the definitive history of the Kari Jews of Egypt from 1882 to 1986, from an insider perspective. The Kari Jews in Egypt, a minority within a minority, minority, had a common bond with a larger community in which they were mainly of Egyptian culture background. They spoke Arabic and used Arabic as their first language. Throughout their history, but mostly in the 19th and 20th century, Kari Jews figured notably in Egyptian society, making important contribution to the art, education, science, business, and philanthropy. Just a few examples of many individuals who should be more broadly recognized include the following. Writer and poet Murad Faraglisha was a leader and legal authority in the Kari community he wrote more than 30 scholarly books between 1898 and 1950, all in Arabic, some dealing with the modern Egyptian law. Composer Daoud Hosni was one of the foremost composers of Arabic music in Egypt in the entire Arab world. In 1906, his song, Prisoner of Love, earned him the first prize in 1906 Paris Music Convention. He wrote hundreds of songs for famous singers of the time, including Laila Murad and Omar Kalsum, the superstar of these. Ibrahim Yusuf Marzu was the highest ranking Jew, Kare Jew, working for the Egyptian government as the director general for the electrification project of the Ministry of Electrical Power, Wazarat al Kahraba. He was Pre President Nasser, main Egyptian contact with the Russian for building generating and distributing electricity from the Aswan Dam, designed and financed by Russia. Nasser put instruction in his file that he could not leave Egypt dead or alive. He and his wife were finally able to leave during the term of President Sadat. Physicist and Professor Yusuf Murad was a leader in the field of solid state physics and electrical measurement technique. Following multiple degrees from the University of Cairo, culminating in a PhD in 1947, he traveled to England to do postdoc work at King's College and returned as a professor of physics at the University of Cairo and an American University of Cairo. He published more than 35 technical papers in international journals. Jeweler David Zakilisha owned one of the best known and finest jewelry shops in Cairo. He also helped to build Moshiadari Synagogue and what is a respected scholar who co authored in 1948 the book El Morshid al Amin, The Faithful Guy. He codified many Kari teachings to interpretation of selection from the Torah. Interesting, an Egyptian professor from Cairo University wrote about the book. The fact that the original book was written in Arabic tells us a lot. They were Jews, yes, but they were also 
fully Egyptian and part of the parcel of the Arab culture as well. Carried community of Cairo worship in two synagogues, Mushidari Abbasiyah, built in 1933, and Rab Samha, which was built in the 19th century and remodeled in 1948. What's important about this picture is to show that the Rav Simha Karai synagogue, one of many synagogues, badly deteriorated following the departure of the Jews. Some sample difference between the Karai and the Rabbanite. And I'm going to keep this brief. Uh, synagogue generally are covered entirely with carpet and rugs, and worshiper remove their shoes before entering. Calendar, the Karai is a lunar calendar. Prohibition against non-Jews performing forbidden work on Shabbat. Slaughtering laws have some differences. The Karit observe the holiday one day instead of two. Shavuot Karit observance always falls on a Sunday. The count start from the first Shabbat. Passover Karit do not eat or drink any fermented food, wine, cheese. We squeeze grapes or raisin to make wine. We celebrate seven days instead of eight, except when it falls on Shabbat. Bill of divorce, the get. Kari do not have such a rule. Women are given right to divorce. Women may act as witnesses. Meat and milk are not prohibited. The prohibition of milk and meat is based on Exodus. I shall not boil a kid in its mother milk. Karait never interpret this, these verses to require the complete separation of milk and meat. Karait interpretation is rooted in compassion for the relationship between the mother and the child. Karait Judaism does not require using separate dishes for milk product and meat product or waiting instead of amount of time after eating meat before consuming dairy. There are four main prayer book. Book Aleph, which is a daily prayer, evening prayer, and Shabbat. Uh, book Beit, those are for the, all the holiday prayer. Book Gimel is Yom Kippur prayer. And Book Dalit is Barachot. Today, these four books have been increased in number. And we have in Book Beit almost one for every holiday. In the United States, we now have English translation and Trent transliteration of our Shabbat prayer. Haggadah, old version was Hebrew only or Arabic transliteration. Later on there was French and English translation and transliteration. The new version that we have right now is since 2015 is with illustration and has English and transliteration. This is a sample of, again, the Haggadah, and top of it is in Hebrew, 
and right here you start right away. Hashem go el Israel, and that's all in transliteration Arabic. And this was in 1948. While Kare is no longer a living Kare, while there is no longer a living Kare Jewish community in Egypt, more than 45,000 descendants now dispersed throughout the world, which is about 0.3% of the Jewish population of 15 million, take pride in our millennium plus heritage. We want to keep our rich history alive for future generations, and we want to ensure that our community contributes to Egyptian life and culture and to the world joy, not to be forgotten. If living, if the living Karate community does not recognize its roots, its rich history, and its ancestry, we fear that no one will in a way that does justice to the personal narrative of so many fascinating individuals who presented the mosaic of the Karate Jewish community of Egypt over centuries. There are 14 Karate synagogues in Israel, the historic being the ancient synagogue in Jerusalem. The synagogue below street level is hung with dozen of silver oil lamp. The floor is carpeted. Worshippers remove their shoes before entering. The gatepost has the Ten Commandments written rather than the usual Jewish mezuzah. The synagogue also contains a Karate Heritage Center where a visitor can discover the origin of the community and hear about the Golden Age in Jerusalem beginning in the 8th century and its great contribution to preserving the Bible and the Hebrew language to speak. In San Francisco, headquarter of the Courage Youth of America, is the nerve center for the scattered community providing meaningful worship and inspiring social activity to about 400 community members. At our synagogue, B'nai Israel, the only Kari Jew synagogue in the United States, as well as a robust set of resources for the larger community. As president of the KGA, I'm so proud of the growth of our community and all that we have achieved. We are small in number, but large in accomplishment. In the early days, we worshiped in people homes. We used to travel with carpets and books and, uh, from home to home. In 1984, in 1986, we had our first prayer pamphlet over Friday night accompanying with the recording to every family in the United States. In 1991, a delegation from the US to Israel visited Turkey, Crimea, Russia, and a few other places. And Murad Kotsi published a book, booklet on the strip summer. In 1991, we purchased the house as the first place of worship. By 1994, we purchased our own building, synagogue Benazir. In 2001, AGA leader, Joe Wahed, co-founded Jemena with Gina Walker. In 2002, we had a Passover Seder event that was filmed for the French Tourism, attended by 250 people. In 20, 2007, there was the first convert. Could you accept the first convert over the past 500 years into the movement? 2016 18, we had renovation and expansion of Benin Israel. We had a big opening gala celebration on August 17 to 19. During COVID, we introduced Zoom services reaching out nationally and internationally. In 2020, partnership to create the Garden of Remembrance at the Pasadena Cemetery in Chicago. In 2022, Learning Center launched online.
the picture just before that was of a Passover mock-up. So we're all celebrating. I'll play it short. There's no sound. I don't know if there should be. Should, should there be sound, David? The music is not playing. The audio, the music is not playing. Okay. I need to stop for a second and just go again. Celebrating our roots, we return to Cairo to create the Garden of Remembrance, to honor the Karait Jewish community of Cairo. Thanks to the support of many of our members across the United States who have worked with RC and the Drop of Milk to create the garden in conjunction with conservation of the grave site within the Karait section of the Bassettin Cemetery. Our objective is to give life to the stone at the Bassettin. It is the story and achievement of our forebears that help us bring history to life. To me, this is personal history. This is the Pasadena Cemetery right here. And as you can see, this is the only small area of the Kari that is left and everything else is going around. For more information, you can refer to the RC website, go to location for links, and the April 10th lecture webinar is in this link. I can also provide those in the chat later. With our current community Jewish history reflecting the Southern Year era, when Judah Arabic culture flourished in Egypt, our small community is a unique in a unique position today, as we rally to preserve our unique identity, our members know that we are at a turning point and that we continue to honor our heritage. We must also look ahead. I'm proud of what we have accomplished and I'm excited to see what lies ahead as we celebrate our past in Egypt and learn from it. 
to sustain our legacy in the future. In fact, Mary Ellen and I will be in Cairo this November to celebrate the KGA partnership with RC and Robert Milk. The trip will be my homecoming to Cairo after absence of 60 years. Future of the Karai Jewish community who survived for thousands of years and we will continue to survive. The future is with our children. Now I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to the Q&A. And if we have time, I can probably play some of the other music. Well, thank you so much, David. That was a wonderful presentation. And uh, I'm very impressed you covered so much ground in 45 minutes. Um, before we open up to questions, I just wanted to mention uh, Jemena. You mentioned that uh, one of the founders of Jemena was Joe Wahid, uh, who obviously is a uh, who was a Karaite. Um, and the other founder is, of course, Gina Waldman. And I thank Gina uh, most uh, warmly for introducing us to you. And of course, Jimena is co-sponsoring this event tonight. I know we have uh, many people from the West Coast here who obviously are members of Jimena or uh, know about their work. Uh, so it is wonderful to know that the Karaites have been associated with Jimena from the very beginning. So, um, Let's look at the questions. Actually, can I start with a question of my own, um, which is, um, you mentioned the Ben Ezra synagogue um, and uh, the, its origin is somewhat disputed between Karaites and, and Rabbanites. Uh, why is that? Surely um, it should be quite clear who founded the synagogue? Well, it's probably went with different time, different hand, and I think uh, when this was pointed out in uh, several past uh, webinar, Professor Mitel is in, until I see a proof in my hand, complete proof, uh, I'm not willing to really accept that yet. Right. And, and basically, as you've seen in the slide, basically the museum and other places think it is, uh, but so there is a debate. Always going to be a question. <laughs> I mean, the reason that there was a lot of uh, Karait uh, finding over there is because it belonged, I'm sure, at some point in time to the Karait at the same time. It was probably, you know, Rabbinite at the same time. So it's how far back do you go? It's hard to say. Right. Um, and there is a question from Amalia. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um ritual slaughter what your practices are and also is there a prohibition on pork well as far as all the jews obviously you know what is kosher the share is followed the same mm -hmm. whether it's uh pork uh, we don't eat pork as far as animals you know birds and all this other stuff it's pretty much the same when it comes to the slaughtering, it's obviously takes a lot more to discuss that in, in detail, but it falls down to is the Karai, number one, will never slaughter an animal that is pregnant. That's number one, to have mm -hmm. compassion. Number two, there are four main veins. You have to cut all four. The rabbinite generally will cut two or more. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to remove all the blood and cover it with dust. So those are some of the things, you know, in a quick summary. Right. That's very interesting. And a question um, from Andrea. She says, in the early Middle Ages, there was a large Karaite population in the kingdom of Hazara, which took Judaism as a state religion, are there reasons to believe that the version of Judaism which was chosen was Karaite? Would you know the answer to that? I'm afraid I don't, <laughs> as far as that. 
I mean, there's a, a lot of things that happened, and I know uh, there was an exhibit in uh, 2017, 2014, of a thousand year old back in the Met Museum where they showed really all the religion, the Muslim, the basically the Jewish and the Christian. And there was a section, you know, a large section, which was, to my surprise, they were talking about the Kari Jews. And basically how somebody was traveling from Europe, going to Jerusalem and back in those area because there was a big area dealing with uh, uh, yeshiva and learning uh, in terms of the Kari. So the Kari were mentioned in a lot of areas. And there's a lot of other items as far as the Kari back then and uh, where they had a lot of the codices that are priceless, that are unique. Yeah, right. And uh, I have two questions actually. Um, what nationality did your parents have when they were expelled from Egypt? Or they, when they left Egypt? My parents did not have any nationality. They were stateless. Right. stateless. My mother, yeah, my mother indirectly uh, probably had, where my grandfather was Tunisian. Basically, he could not become basically an Egyptian citizen or anything of that sort. So you end up having to buy basically like a Tunisian passport, uh, different French, different of those things. So that's where there were a few people that had Egyptian nationality, but those were far. Few and far people. between, yes. right. Because you, if, since you, you, you were such an ancient community and you've been there for so long, you obviously could qualify if you paid the money to be Egyptian, couldn't you? Well, no, you couldn't do that at all. You couldn't pay the money or anything at all. This was just, you're a Jew, you're, and very but, few people that managed to get in that uh, now. That's most interesting. And the other question um, is, is what future do you see for uh, the community in, uh, in Egypt? And um, what hope do you have for the um, restoration of the uh, Basatin Cemetery? Well, as far as the future in Egypt, it relies on the people who are there. Is Magda Haroun is the president. And the other person that is really a key role in everything is Sami Ibrahim. Mm -hmm. Sami has been carrying a lot of the work in the Basitin Cemetery, synagogues, and everything else. His father was, was Jewish. Mm -hmm. uh, so he has, but he is married in basically to the person I believe from Palestine, I'm not exactly sure. Mm -hmm. and he basically does everything he can to help uh, community and to preserve. And in fact, one day he said, I would like to publish a lot of those books um, for, for a bay and other areas. And he's, he's a very helpful guy in many situations. So I'm sure that there are opportunities he's trying to maintain and do the, what he can in terms of the VASA team. There's a large group of uh, rabbinites from uh, possibly England and uh, France uh, and other area in the United States that were traveling to take care of, because they had a big uh, road, highway and bridges that they were crossing the Basatine and what's legal, what's not legal. So they were really the Egyptian government were trying to work together very carefully with everybody. Right, and uh, do you see there being a heritage center built there? Well, that's what we're Mary Ellen hope and dreams is to be able to establish something. And so as Sammy, we're trying to see if there's a possibility of doing in that section of land between the two in the Nasha and Lisha family to put something there and then maybe uh, uh, introducing some kind of uh, museum or whatever in one of the synagogues. Right. Which is closer to Egypt in the town. 
Okay, and uh, Zahra, who's our um, tour guide in Alexandria, hello Zahra, she wonders uh, how many Karaite synagogues used to be in Egypt, especially Alexandria and the Delta. She thinks they had the uh, Azuz synagogue, um, and she's trying to find out where else. Um, and she's also trying to find the Karaite cemetery in Alexandria. Do you know anything about that? Well, I'm not exactly sure if there is a Karaite cemetery completely, but there may be a section there. I know when a uh, friend of ours, which is Rainey and her husband, Jovesa, ended up going to Egypt specifically to take a look at her father's grave and she would spend a lot of time trying to figure out where the grave is or anything of that sort. And finally, they had some record books. Luckily, they brought them out, they started looking for the names that can find them. And then after that, they said, oh, it's name, the names are written, you know, in uh, first name, last name, or something of that sort. And they managed to find the location. Unfortunately, in, in Cairo, that does not exist at all. There is no record of where any person, where, it, where the person is buried. It's very difficult. Um, right, and uh, it's, it's well known that Egyptian Jews have trouble accessing their, um, their, their records, especially uh, circumcision and, and marriage and, uh, records. Um, is this also the case for the Karaite uh, records? Can you tell us yeah. anything about that? Sure, it is generally very difficult. However, back in, uh, I don't know, maybe in the eighties or something of that sort, Morado Otsi and some others were able to have photocopies of some of those records. And I showed a sample of the basically wedding and marriage early on into 1951. Yes. So, and I know I've seen the verse record, my verse record written, not a very clear copy, but uh, I've seen a, a photocopy. Right. So, so if you're Karaite in a way, um, <laughs> you're luckier than most uh, Egyptian well, Jews. I don't know. I'm sure a lot of the other Jews have also a lot of books and records. I've seen a lot of copies somehow, but they may not have them, or they may have pictures, but not all the details. I think they've kept very, very good records. Mm -hmm. I think this is something that's going to be a battle for quite a long time, because I don't know exactly what what the story behind it is. The question is that if you get those records, you end up getting also what belong to you, uh, the building, possession, anything else, uh, are those really supposed to stay in the country or go outside. Mm -hmm. I know everybody's just trying to say, well, just give us a copy. Yeah. Every other country allows you to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, shall we allow Daniel to speak? Sure Sorry, Dan Daniel Abel has asked to speak. Actually, Daniel, can you write <clears throat> your can you write your comment in the in the chat? Or you'd rather speak? Okay, I'll ask you to unmute. Yeah. Danielle, are you unmuting? Hello? You have to unmute. No, no, we can't, can't hear you. Next question. Then. Yeah. Okay. Now, a question from Linda: Do the Karaites use biblical names or Arabic names for their children? Okay. Has he muted himself? Uh, David, sorry, can you unmute yourself? You muted yourself. Yeah. 
Hey, David. So, yeah. Yes. So basically, the, during certain times, people were using Arabic names mixed with also Jewish biblical names. It's just like Joseph and Yusuf. It's the same kind of thing. Abdallah is Ovadia. Okay. Translating Abdallah, translating into uh, English or anything else is Ovadia or Hebrew. Yeah. Uh, so my name was Tafik uh, because of the 1948, 1950 war, that kind of time that was the game, name I was given. Mm hmm. You know, so it's just like Farag and Shoah. So there is a lot of names that are very uh, more in Arabic to be able to be around with the community in terms of the names of these. Right. Okay. And um, can we hear a musical excerpt? I know that uh, some of the music, some of the chanting is very different in the, the Karaite tradition. Uh, can you possibly? Play some of that. Let me see if I can do something in here. I'm going to probably play part of the celebration. Mm -hmm. Can I have the share screen option available again? Yes, sure. Yeah. One researcher spent 20 years investigating the lives of men who lived. Oops. Just a second, I think. Yeah, sure. Kadosh Venora. Thank you very much for that. Uh, 
Okay, um, lots of audience participation there. Um, several questions about uh, Karaites in Israel, and are they fully accepted as uh, halachically Jewish? Uh, repeat the question. Um, the Karaites in Israel, uh, how big is the community, and are they accepted as halach halachically Jewish? Well, the, they have their own Beit Din, so they are able to really perform any uh, wedding ceremonies and record all that. They can do Brit, they can do any, any of those things, and they're recognized without a problem. Right now, uh, they have their own Karai butcher uh, and everything. It's been a fight in a lot of time where a lot of the Israeli Jews have not been uh, well treated uh, in Israel in the very beginning. Things are changing. Where right now, a lot more Israeli uh, Jews, maybe almost 50% or more. So it's ch things change. Politics always change. I know that back in the very beginning when the Egyptian Jews moved to Israel, they were in the very poor areas and districts. After that, uh, I know there was a, a meeting with Ben Gurion back then. So a lot of people tried to do things to recognize what's going on. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And um, I know before um, our meeting started, I was talking to you about uh, you mentioned that there were Karaites, other Karaite communities outside Egypt, for instance, in Eastern Europe and in the Ukraine. Um, do you have any links with those communities? And can you tell us anything about them? Well, uh, there are links that are available on the website for some of those. And there's also uh, in Israel, and I do think there are some people from Israel, I do have some communication with some of them. Is it a lot? Probably not. Because uh, our, if you take a look at our basic books, the four books that I talked about, they were printed in Russia uh, back in 1850 and 1891 they printed. Then after that, they were printed again in Egypt and in Israel. Uh, so it's very well known that Jews, Karai Jews were everywhere. There is a oops, sorry, I'm not sure that that was meant to happen. <laughs> That's somebody's screen. Um, I'll stop the screen share again, sorry. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, well. yeah. not use a screen share. <laughs> okay. okay. Right. So just one question from Boris um, about about the Hazaras in um, in Russia. Apparently, there was a legal distinction um, made between Jews and Karaites under Catherine the Great. Was there a similar sort of distinction in Egypt? Um, I don't know if, if this is a fair question. <laughs> Probably it's not completely, but all I know that in Egypt, the Karaites were recognized as Karaites. Yeah. Uh, you know, because they're also given the land and they were respected, you know, completely each side. And they had, you know, most of the time they were, I know a lot of time when I was a little kid, I used to go also to rabbinic uh, school, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's Hebrew school or we used to love a lot of the holidays where they used to give us a lot of uh, gifts or parties and stuff like that. So we did both. So the relationship was was uh, generally pretty good. Once in a while, there was some misunderstanding or confusion where uh, you allow somebody curry to marry non curry and vice versa. You know, that uh, had changed not quite a bit. I mean, obviously, people did not want to lose their identity or completely. So there was some regulation put by Achanin back at that time. Okay, that's that's great. 
I think um, we'll wrap up there. Um, I'd like to thank you so much, David, for um, your time and for an absolutely fascinating presentation. And I wish you all the best with your projects, with the restoration and preservation of the uh, Karaite graves in the Basatine Cemetery and the survival, uh, you know, the preservation of your, your uh, community. Um, so I think we will end the formal um, part of this, of this presentation, of this meeting, but if anyone wants to stay on and uh, unmute themselves and ask a question off the record, they are most welcome to do so. Just to tell you about our future events, uh, I'm, unfortunately, we haven't been able to um, do the advertisements this time well, as we, we usually we, we do. We can do, but we've got one computer. And <laughs> it's a bit can... difficult technically. Uh, but to give you the heads up for our next meeting, uh, it'll be in two weeks' time on the 28th of June. And we'll be focusing on the impact of the Six Day War on the remaining Jewish communities in the Arab world. I hope this will be a two part presentation or session. Uh, the first session will be on Egypt. Uh, so obviously the Karaites are concerned. Uh, Egypt, Libya and Iraq, where we, we will have uh, people's testimonies of what it was like uh, to live through that period. Uh, so I hope you all join us then, 28th of June, and, um, and you will get all the details if you're on our mailing list. So thank you once again. Thank you, David. And uh, over, over to you all, if you want to say goodbye, thank you, or make any, any kind of comments. We'll stop the recording in a minute. Everyone can now unmute themselves. Thank you for all okay. this information. <laughs> okay. Daniel, thank you, like David, for this excellent presentation. This is Alain Farhi. Oh, hi, Allah. Lovely to see you again. Okay, I'll stop recording yeah. now, yeah? yeah.